Welcome. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, How to Embed Social-Emotional Learning into MTSS and RTI. I'm Nicole Mickle from Panorama Education, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, please note you can use the icons at the bottom of the webinar portal to submit questions, download the resources from our slides, and troubleshoot any audio issues. We will send a recording to everyone who joined the webinar afterwards. If you'd like to join the conversation virtually, feel free to tweet at Panorama Ed. Let's begin with a few introductions of this fantastic group of educators and leaders we'll hear from today. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Amanda Allen. Dr. Allen, it is our pleasure to have you today. Could you start us off by sharing your background, your role in Johnston County, and what's exciting you about this conversation today? Thank you for such a warm welcome, Nicole. Um, so as you can see on the slide, my current role in Johnson County Public Schools is the Executive Director of Social and Emotional Learning. I've held this role since um, the summer of 2018. Prior to that, I was a school counselor for eight years. And during that time, the ent entire time, I was the assistance team, RTI, and an MTSS coach. So I'm very well versed in those areas. And I could not be more excited about talking about how you can integrate social emotional learning into these concepts. Awesome, we're so happy to have you. I'll go next. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Nicole. I'm an account director at Panorama Education. At Panorama, it's my privilege to support districts around the country in the improvement of school experiences and student outcomes using data, social emotional learning data, school climate data, alongside academic behavior and attendance data as well. I also have the privilege, privilege of working closely with Johnston County Public Schools to advance their SEL, MTSS, and equity goals. At Panorama, we believe that data can and should be used to improve student outcomes. Prior to supporting schools and districts with this mission across the country, I focused in on Massachusetts, working at the Massachusetts Department of Education, designing and implementing statewide data systems to help educators in decision making. And now I'll turn it over to Doug, our second presenter today, to introduce himself. Hi, all. I'm Doug Hassett on our teaching and learning team. I lead our strategic advising practice, which supports districts and states to roll out panorama platforms as they fit the existing SEL or MTSS initiatives more broadly. So when and how do we introduce the platform, who gets trained, and how will we embed it into existing systems so it's not another thing. Uh, prior to joining Panorama, I was a math coach and math assessment developer, and prior to that, a uh, teacher, kindergarten, fifth grade, and sixth grade, all math and science, and happy to be participating today. Thanks so much, Doug. With Dr. Allen and Doug as our guides, we'll explore five strategies for incorporating SEL into MTSS and RTI. The format will be a dialogue between us. Doug and I will share tips from Panorama's teaching and learning team, who partners nationally with districts on their MTSS programs, and Dr. Allen will share her story of how she works to support students with SEL interventions in Johnston County. We will also give you an opportunity to reflect on your own practice and ask questions. As you have questions, please feel free to type them into the webinar portal and we'll make time for them at the end. Before we dig into today's material, I wanted to quickly make note of what we mean by MTSS, or a multi-tiered system of support. When we talk about MTSS, we are referring to a cohesive, integrated model for interventions that emphasizes teaching the whole child using data-driven decision-making. These interventions are sometimes called the MTSS pyramid because educators deliver tiered interventions based on student needs. Tier one supports are referred to as universal or core because they are provided to every student. Examples of strong tier one supports include high quality core instruction, positive behavioral supports, or prioritizing school climate and social emotional learning for all students. Tier two supports refer to services that are targeted or supplemental and specifically delivered to around 15 to 20% of students. In addition to identifying students who need tier two support, schools use data from multiple domains to determine the right intervention for each student who is at risk. 
they typically agree upon cut points to help them know when a student is at risk and when a tier two support is required. Tier three supports refers to intensive services that one to 5% of students receive if they continue to struggle and require even more support. Now that we have some terms defined, we'd like to get a sense of the audience and where you are in this journey through a poll. Please respond, do you have tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions in place in your school or district community for SEL? I'll give you some time to consider your answer. Feel free to enter in the box that should have appeared on your screen. Great. Thank you so much for participating. As these poll results are loading in, let's turn our attention to today's speaker, Dr. Amanda Allen. Dr. Allen, could you introduce Johnston County Public Schools and the district's emphasis on SEL? Absolutely. So as you can see on the slide, there's a little bit of information about our district in general. We've got over 37,000 students here, and we've got 46 schools that are being served. It's important to know that social emotional learning really came into conversation for our district in 2017. We were also talking very heavily about personalized learning during that time, and we had choice professional development that went out to our teachers. And personalized learning, to be honest, was our big emphasis for that year, but close behind in terms of interest and, and people wanting to get into those sessions was that social emotional learning. And once teachers got into those sessions and they learned about what social emotional learning consists of, what it is and what it isn't, things just took off. It was easy to get teacher buy-in because this is just what makes sense. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. In our work together, I've always been so impressed by how your vision and leadership is driving impact across a large school district comprised of many, many students with diverse needs. Okay, here are our results from the poll. So it looks like in our audience, about half of us, about 51.6% have Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 interventions in place, and about 48.4% of us do not. For those of us who don't have tier supports in place, um, today we'll share some best practices and concrete strategies so that you can walk away from today's webinar with actionable takeaways. For those of you who do, we're excited to share ways to help you continue to evolve and improve your SEL supports for students. Here's an overview of the five strategies for building SEL into MTSS that we'll address together on this webinar. One, use SEL to strengthen your Tier 1 foundation. Two, incorporate SEL into decision-making processes. Three, build SEL supports into your tiered intervention strategy. Four, get the right human and data systems in place. And five, practice data inquiry to ask and answer questions and take action. Let's dig into strategy number one, using SEL to strengthen your Tier 1 foundation. This one is especially important because at its best, MTSS is a tool that ensures we are serving all students and that every student receives the support they need. One of the bedrock assumptions of MTSS is that most of our students' needs are met through universal support. In other words, the MTSS pyramid is healthy when the needs of the majority of students in your school are effectively served by those base tier one systems. In practice, we know that's a real challenge, and as leaders, we constantly have to ask ourselves, are we meeting most of our students' needs through tier one supports? If we are, how do we truly know? What data are we looking at? Dr. Allen, I'd love to invite you back into the conversation to talk about the why behind SEL in Johnston County um, and how you built out your SEL vision to include a strong base of Tier 1 supports. Absolutely. And anytime you're talking about the foundation behind something, you need to know the reason why 
this new thing or the, this new acronym is being done, especially in education because we hear so many new things. So what you're seeing in front of you are three of the biggest circles in my life. Uh, we've got the portrait of the graduate, which is specific to our district. And even though we've got an image, a silhouette of two seemingly high school graduates, this is uh, encompasses all of the character traits that we expect our students to embrace from preschool on. And then I'm sure many of you have seen the castle cell model, and that's what's in the center right there for you. All the work that I'm doing in the district that's specifically targeting social emotional learning, this is the lens through which I'm working because those castle components are all encompassing to everything else that we're doing to make sure that students are able to learn as they need to. And then the circle all the way to the left is one that we talk about a lot in North Carolina public schools. And this is what we've got for our whole child development. Because when you're an educator, you know, especially our amazing classroom teachers, that you are serving all the needs of that student. They're not coming in ready to learn necessarily. You've got to make sure that you're taking care of the needs that might be prohibiting their brains from absorbing new information and just making sure that they've got this whole child wellness. And social emotional learning integration definitely addresses this. So next I'll talk about measuring and understanding social emotional learning and the school environment with Panorama. As you can see, this is our portrait of a graduate again. For our district, we chose to survey our students on the six components that you see. That sense of belonging and valuing of school, those two items we don't have directly linked back to our students because we want them to have that anonymity to say what they need to in those areas. But when you're looking at self-management, social awareness, classroom effort, and learning strategies, those are things that with the panorama data we can dial down and see exactly how students are rating themselves on those components. And when choosing them, we all got together, looked at the survey questions, and decided how those would relate back to those character traits that we wanted all of our students to really have integrated within themselves and in their lives. So it's important to note that something like learning strategies, that's the overall theme of that set of questions. But within that, you've got things that touch on grit and growth mindset. And that was really foundational for how we chose those items. And next I'll speak a little bit about how we've built social emotional learning, our vision to build a strong tier one support. So this first point I can't emphasize enough. Universal supports look different in different schools. In fact, I saw some of our people logging on and I'm excited to see some people who are local to Johnson County and you might be thinking, we don't have those supports in our school. And with all honesty, we are at different phases with different schools. So if you're in a district where you feel like that's the case, just know that you're not alone. And it's also important to note that it's all de determined based on the programs that your school is embracing the most. For example, some of our schools are capturing kids' heart schools, which is a phenomenal program, but it also has a high price tag associated with it, which is why we've got some schools doing that versus all of them at this time. And at those schools, that's a tier one level support because the whole student body is experiencing the components of that program. Similarly, we have four of our schools working with the North Carolina Resilience and Learning Project, and we could not be more excited about that. But the things that are integrated within that program are tier one for that school, but if we took pieces of that and integrated it into another school, it might not be as core to the other school who's not working with that program. Another thing to remember is that we're really prioritizing the school climate so that every child is feeling safe. And we touched on that a little bit when we talked about the why. And the biggest thing to remember when you're working through your tier one supports is that this is all about building those positive relationships between teachers and students, not just at those primary levels, kindergarten through fifth grade, but in middle school and in high school because that's how we get the kids coming back to us every single day. That's how we get the kids wanting to complete the work we're asking them to do and they're bought into their education just as much as we are. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, and really just want to emphasize your point about considering the whole child and considering what's working at the school level in terms of Tier 1 and Tier 2 interventions. We also wanted to share just a few fun and low with lift ways to build SEL into your classroom practices. Here are three of our favorites from the Panorama team. A feelings journal helps students with emotion regulation. In the middle, we have two by 10 relationship building. Um, it's as simple as taking two minutes and 10 school days um, to build relationships with students, to Dr. Allen's point, on really anything, anything fun or exciting to that particular student. And then lastly, um, in the orange, SEL Passport is a great way to help students practice and master SEL skills both inside and outside their classroom um, to really integrate those practices um, into their day-to-day. -day. Feel free to steal some of these strategies to implement in your own school community. While there are so many ways to build social and emotional learning into your schools at the universal level, we've seen it be most impactful when you focus on building a few targeted student competencies. This way your SCL and MTSS programs can really strengthen your existing priorities. So consider which broader priorities will help you choose your SEL and climate focus areas. In thinking through this question, this slide shows research from the Panorama team on the top three correlated SEL skills impacting attendance, behavior, and course performance. So if, for example, behavior is a priority in your district or building, you might consider um, thinking about measuring and supporting SEL strategies that help with self-management, social awareness, and those key teacher-student relationships. You can read a little bit more from our research brief online that we'll link at the end of this webinar. Whichever SEL focus area you choose, consider how you'll make it stick by investing and communicating with teachers, families, and students. Some key questions to consider are, when and where is the ideal time to introduce this work to your team? Where should you see social-emotional learning in your school? What activities and or resources will you share with your team? Who are the key people who will lead this work at your campus? And finally, how will you break your goals into steps to focus and prioritize your effort? And then what are your immediate next steps that you'll hold yourself and your team accountable to? I also wanted to share some additional information with the audience regarding how to collect social emotional learning data with Panorama's SEL tool, as Johnston County is doing. Panorama's social and emotional learning survey is a valid and research-backed tool meant to assess student perspectives of their own social and emotional skills and competencies, as well as student supports and environments. Now let's move on to strategy number two, incorporating SEL into decision-making processes. The promise of MTSS is a coherent system with educators across the district using data to inform their practice. For it to truly work for students, we need to ask ourselves, do staff in our district feel comfortable using data to inform student supports and interventions? Do we have an effective process to know if an intervention is successful or needs a change of course? Dr. Allen, you've shared your commitment to measuring social and emotional learning, and I'm hoping you can tell us a bit more about how you identify students for Tier 2 and Tier 3 SEL supports. Absolutely. That data is really going to help you in all the conversations that you need to have in terms of if you're talking about the importance of this at a school level, uh, with a parent, with a teacher, all of these things. So the way that we're leveraging this social and emotional learning data in our district We've got a lot of different ways. This first bullet item, the SEL screener data, we actually created a local screening tool that's based on observable behaviors that teachers can tell after one or two weeks with students. It's only 10 items and it just talks about how frequently they observe a behavior or an absence of a behavior. So we've used that information at schools who have enjoyed piloting it to get a little bit of extra information for that teacher observation piece. We 
also take whatever information we're using and we try to triangulate it. You know, if I'm only looking at that teacher observation information, it might be skewed and there might be some more stuff going on that the teacher doesn't know about or there could be a, a, a bias that's happened between the teacher and the student because of a, an altercation or something that's happened in their past with one another. So it's important to always look at different data sets. You know, what is the student saying about their own abilities for social emotional learning? What does the parent say? What does the attendance data say? What's that academic information? All of that brought together to really see that whole child that we're trying to serve. And then we're using this type of information to figure out who needs a little bit more than that core level of support. When we think about the pyramid model in MTSS, we think about 80% of the students can be served at that, key, that, that core foundational level at the bottom. But then when you're thinking about the other 20% of students, you might want to consider if they need some additional support, some help in social emotional learning specifically. But we'll typically, like with that locally made screener that we've got, we'll take all that data and then we'll look and see where that most needy 20% fall, where that cut point is, and then we'll bring the human component to it and look at the names and say, did we miss anybody that we know needs some extra support? And the big takeaway from this is that we are looking at that data together and we're having critical conversations about which children may need support, which children may have had a bad day whenever they were being observed or given the self-rating, you know, what's that whole picture that we're looking at. And then this last bullet I want to emphasize here, counselors, school counselors are absolutely some of your SEL experts in the building but they're not the only ones capable of delivering social emotional learning support. And I know that that might be against um, some common belief because you think, you know, you're trained in things, you should be the leader on delivery as well. But social emotional learning is so, um, it's, it's so broadly encompassing of just helping individuals manage their time better, build relationships with others, resolve conflicts. And typically in a school, you've only got one counselor for an astronomical number of students to be served and if you're going to make critical strides in these areas then it's a lift for everybody to take on to where counselors are, are wonderful but we need to make sure that that information is widely distributed so we can all support students. Uh, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about the pilot we're doing with Panorama and the student success platform in our community. What you see on the screen here is it's one of the screens that you would see in the student success platform. So this student, as you can see, <clears throat> you can look at their coursework, how they're progressing there or lack thereof for the student. You've got attendance information, behavior, and that social emotional learning component. And you also see that we still have that third round of SEL surveys through Panorama that has not been completed here. But think about this. What is this picture telling you? You see that the student's coursework has started to decline through these three different measure points. The attendance has also been declining. And then, you know, it looks like our behavior has stayed consistent, but then that social emotional learning piece is also on the decline. So this is when you want to talk about what this data is telling you. Where is the root of this? What's been happening? So, I, you know, you want to talk with a team and figure out, is this coursework starting to decline because the student's just not coming to school? And if that's the case, what's keeping them from school? And then is that tied to their social emotional learning capacity, their conflict resolution? Are they avoiding somebody that they have in the school or something that's gone on? There's a myriad of things to discuss at that point, but it's always important to look at how that SEL piece might connect because just like us as adults, kids can get in their own head about things and prevent themselves from moving forward in a successful way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for modeling for our audience, <clears throat> excuse me, how you and your team might look at this data and do some of that triangulation that you were referring to earlier. Now that we've covered using SEL data to strengthen Tier 1 universal supports and identifying students using SEL data cut points, it's time now to explore how educators can build SEL support into a tiered intervention strategy. Dr. Allen, what are some examples of Tier 2 supports in Johnson County? 
so on the next slide, you'll see that we've got some things popping up. Um, we've got different components that we pull in for tier two specifically. Oh, we don't. I apologize. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> so now you can see the tier two supports that we've got in our district. But one thing that I always talk to teams about is what a tier two strategy might look like at one school, just like we said with that core foundation, it differs based on school site. If I have an elementary school where in every single classroom they have a calm down space, a peace corner, some type of retreat that a student can go to if they're starting to feel themselves become escalated, then that's a, a tier one support for that school. But then if I go over to another school where that's not something that they've introduced universally, but we've got a student who's having a very difficult time regulating their own emotions and they need that space to calm down and get themselves back on track, that might be a tier two level support because otherwise that classroom did not have that integrated. So I just wanted to clarify that because, you know, conflict resolution, we want to work that in with all students. And the calm down spots are universal in some spots, but it could be that tier two support if it wasn't already a part of the foundational culture of the school. Check in and check out. We're doing that as well as in some of our schools, we've got mentoring systems in place. And those are just some examples of tier two. However, just like we've got some fluidity between tier one and tier two, the same is true for tier two and tier three because Setting somebody up with a mentor can be a little bit more in-depth and it can go into the Tier 3 realm as well. I love how Dr. Allen really focused us on four high-impact intervention practices. We see at Panorama from our work with school districts across the country that oftentimes a smaller um, agreed-upon list is more. Building a district specific list of SEL best practices helps educators to really speak a shared language as a team and build the skills of their team to execute evidence-based interventions with a strategy focus and professional development in the future. This is a screenshot of our intervention menu or library in Panorama's intervention management platform and student success. So this is where our partners really have the ability to name those intervention supports as well as the appropriate grade levels subjects and tiers, taking into account some of that fluidity that Dr. Allen was talking about, how sometimes something might be a tier one or a tier two or a tier three. So just wanted to show that to everyone today. Our next strategy is build out your human and data systems. As educators going deep in the work of schools, we know that having a shared language and a clear vision isn't enough. Your plan can be flawless, but when you need to have people, the people to execute on it, and that's really important. Both SEL and MTSS are team sports. Everyone in the building has a role in making it work. And as leaders, we need to build human systems to weave SEL and MTSS into our school culture. Dr. Allen, as someone who's deep in this work and who's made so much progress over the last year and a half, what are the human systems and processes you're using to make SEL support stick in Johnston County? I have to start by saying this is my absolute favorite strategy that you're covering today because that human component is so, so important. As you can see uh, from my little favorite image up here, you can't pour from an empty cup. If you've ever read that bucket filler story or anything similar, you've really got to make sure that you're taking care of yourself first, that you're feeling well in, inside and out before you can really demonstrate these social emotional learning practices to others. So when we rolled out that professional development in 2017, I think that I initially uh, had some people a little bit confused because the activities were all focused on the individual adults who are going through the professional development. And that was very intentional on my part because you've got to look in and see where you are for your self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, all of these things before you can expect yourself to successfully integrate these things into your classroom. And not only that, if you're focusing on them on your own, you're learning strategies that you're going to naturally push out into your classroom. For example, uh, I'm always trying to come up with new ways to organize my own information, you know, maybe information I'm getting from professional development just like this, or maybe my time management or making new lists. 
If you're doing that for yourself, there's a good chance you're also going to be integrating similar practices for the students in your classroom because it's just human nature that when you find something that's wonderful, you're going to want to share it on with others. So that's really my favorite part about this. But another piece that might be more practical, well, I don't think you can get more practical than what I was just talking about, but is also practical. I wanted to point out that you can leverage funding sources such as Title IV funding that, you know, there has to be that mental health, social, emotional wellness component towards <clears throat> moving this initiative along in your district. This year, we chose to post two openings to SEL interventionist positions that I'm excited we just recently filled, and they'll start later this month in the beginning of next month. But we were able to fund these through that Title IV funding to make a greater impact on the work that's being done in our district. And you can see the little the job goals that we had typed up for when those positions before they were filled. And then, you know, creating central office positions even in titling, really shows the dedication that the district has in place and that this isn't something that's just going to come and then leave in a year or so. It's really giving that emphasis on this practice. And then, of course, offering professional development and resources. But I really can't emphasize enough just practicing your own self-care and your own ability to embrace these SEL components. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for highlighting the importance of adult SEL, um, as well as um, practically the, the job description with the audience. I'm sure there are many people out there who would love to copy paste this and hire for this role, and maybe there are some audience members who would be um, perfect fits. Data systems can support human systems by making it easier to collaborate and build a unified process for identifying at-risk students and create and share intervention plans. In Panorama's Student Success Platform, you can see a full picture of students' academic, attendance, and coursework performance at the school or individual student level. To Dr. Allen's earlier point, this helps triangulate data to ensure we're allocating the right support at the right time to the right student. And then, we've heard a key challenge of MTSS is how to progress monitor and know what's working. Um, here's an example of how schools can help progress monitor at the student or school level. The image on the left shows an individual student's progress towards their specific goal, their student-specific goal. The image on the right shows what this information looks like in the aggregate in Panorama Student Success. This view allows educators to really measure the effectiveness of interventions and spread the most effective interventions across the school community. Throughout this presentation, we've discussed data as a key piece of the MTSS process, but sometimes we know all too well that school leaders and staff don't feel comfortable using data to inform interventions. For this next strategy of practicing data inquiry, I have the privilege of turning it over to Doug Hassett to lead you all through some examples of how using data inquiry can inform and strengthen SEL interventions in schools. Doug. Thanks, Nicole. And Nicole and I are actually honored to be able to travel to Johnson soon and, um, and pick back up and support the work on site in a couple of weeks. So the examples that we share here around data inquiry um, are real examples, real exercises from real teams like Johnson's. So <clears throat> excited to bring a few of these to us today. So on data inquiry, what is data inquiry and, and why do it? The premise here is that beyond the numbers that we look at, in student success or another platform, beyond those numbers is a narrative. And so we can look at data and focus on a given number, but it won't, really like, it won't uh, likely translate into better support for students unless it's considered in context. So to take a, a, a brief and common example, academic data is acknowledged widely to be critical, um, and in many cases it represents an outcome that we want to change. So it's necessary to have that information, but it's not sufficient on its own to be able to change it. So if you're looking at below grade level math performance, for example, that ought to be treated differently if the student's attending 100% of class days versus 70%. The same below, uh, below grade level math performance ought to be treated differently if the student is self-reported um, as highly confident and connected to people at school versus low confidence and low connection. Um, and so the data inquiry process, 
we really begin by looking at the data holistically. So attendance, behavior, coursework, social, emotional learning data, all in one place so we can get a, a more complete picture. And for, start, and for partners who are starting off, perhaps they've recently integrated the data um, into a single view for the first time, we really start with these kind of basic questions here. First, what did you notice when you're looking at the data? <clears throat> Connected to that, what might that mean? And then only then, um, what actions might you take in response? So we will get to action, but we don't, we don't hurry there. We stay. We start by reflecting on really what, what do we see and what does that mean in our context? So here's an example of an exercise that you could do with your educators for initial sense making of a new data set. So we do this with dozens of teachers at a school site. We do this with hundreds of district administrators across the state um, at, a, at a state retreat. It's the four corners exercise. Um, and after some time looking at your data, each caring adult would physically move to the corner that represents the noticing or the wondering that they want to discuss more. And so here um, are some common themes to name. Of course, this four corners exercise is customizable, uh, but we offer the following four um, the following four themes, we think, to, to get a diverse range of, of mindsets here. So take a moment just to read those. You know, a notable difference between how groups of students are feeling, oftentimes we see um, race and ethnicity differences elevated here. This becomes a conversation about equity. Um, a success to celebrate is often a, a, an important entry point into, you know, a new system, um, an area that relates to an existing focus. This allows people to bring their context forward, so it's not a kind of data exclusive conversation. So again, this can be customized. Um, and we use this most often at the beginning of an engagement. So if your SEL initiative or your MTSS initiative is just budding, uh, if you recently began your partnership with Panorama um, and your caring adults are seeing a new platform for the first time, this processing is particularly important. That being said, there's also value in revisiting this more often, especially as new data is updated or if you have deeper, more nuanced questions that you want to represent as corners here. So a good place to start, the four corners exercise. When we come on site with partners, <clears throat> we start out with an orientation to student success. The platform uh, that Dr. Allen referenced before facilitating um, more targeted inquiry that gets at the heart of what supporting students means for that community. Um, so here are a few common questions that we ask, answer, and take action on with partners. <clears throat> and the common characteristic here is really that each question brings together a more conventionally tracked performance indicator like academics or behavior with social emotional learning, um, which is less often represented quantitatively. So before we unpack um, at least a couple of those questions, I want to pause and say a bit more about the form that our support can take when we help our partners wrestle with some of these questions. So executive briefings, this is an on-site presentation to often a district leadership team. We name not just the data, but the insights represented by the data, and we offer some recommendations of how you could take action to better understand and respond to them. So that's kind of a standalone couple hours with a district leadership team, a cabinet, a school board. Coaching. These are multiple touch points with leadership teams, usually at the school level. They're spread out over the school year and begin by helping a team prioritize their focus. So what is their big question or two that they're really serious about focusing on? And then we move into action. So what does research or experience suggest you could do to improve? And this might be a meeting structure or an evidence-based strategy. System advising is our most intensive offering. Here we're involved in really 
um, on site alongside the team, directly supporting and advising every step of the way, from a facilitated needs assessment of practices across the district, to helping message out priorities, to modeling exemplar student support meetings at a school site with staff. And I share this here just because this is the context in which we often learn about and address these following questions. So let's take this first, this first common question here. Um, how many students with no self-reported strengths in social emotional learning are also identified as at risk in their academic data? And then a follow-up you know, for the students for whom that's true, which SEL competency do they self-report they struggle with the most? So some version of this question is often asked when caring adults see academic and SEL data alongside one another for the first time, right? How many students, um, you know, are low in both of these things? Might there be a connection? Now, on the next slide, you'll see um, a brief recording of what it looks like to answer this question in our student success platform. So um, I'll show that maybe two times, but note that this is um, a data platform for demonstration purposes with scrambled data, so not actual student names and scores here. So we'll, we'll play that one more time here. So this is identifying, okay, here's how our students responded to the SEL survey. Let's select just those that have self-reported lowest. And then let's also identify those that are lower in academics. And now we've got a list of students that meet those criteria. So this is just an example of how um, asking and answering this question works on site with student success. So after asking and answering the question, the next step is to consider actions. And we often reflect um, with this question in mind. You just listen to students' voices when we look at SEL survey data, at least. So how will they know that they've been heard? And one step that partners who are serious about improving SEL perceptions among students take is um, implementing explicit whole group breathing work and strategies. So. Um, some examples on the on the screen here of the forms that that could take, but calm, calming breathing techniques is something for all ages I want to emphasize. The youngest grades, this could be on the rug at a morning meeting. Middle grades, you know, this is coming back from a high energy time like recess or lunch, as well as at the high school level, we've heard from high school veteran teachers in um, in large cities that the single best strategy to get students to arrive to class on time was to start minute zero or minute one with a breathing exercise. So this is um, for, for all ages here, kind of tier one um, strategy to support students uh, in social emotional learning. Here's another common question. So in school, are students with low self-efficacy typically on track for graduation in terms of coursework? So this one is similar to the first, but it's about a specific social-emotional learning topic, self-efficacy, which uh, for Panorama, the way we ask this question, these uh, questions about this topic, we're getting at how much students believe they can succeed in achieving academic outcomes. So a question like this, more specific than the first, typically comes from a district or a team that's been investing in a particular SEL topic for some time, usually at least a year. So again, I'll show a clip maybe twice of what it looks like to answer this question in uh, Panorama Student Success Platform. So opening up the SEL data here and specifically selecting for a, the topic self-efficacy, so students who have self-reported low there. And then let's look at those students who are on track academically.
And again, now we have a, a list, really a group of students who, who meet that criteria. So in our last example of action, we shared, you know, breathing techniques and offered that as a tier one universal support, right? All students who walk into the class or the building can, can receive that. In this case, let's use the example um, to share the way this might look in a tier two approach. So here, peer support groups, a research-backed strategy some of our partners used uh, to support students who self-reflect low in self-efficacy. Um, so if, if you know that you're going to roll out peer support groups, not for all students, but for some students, so a tier two uh, intervention or support for students who meet certain criteria, um, on this next screen will be a pre-recorded clip of what documenting a group intervention could look like. So not all students are receiving this, just a subset. So let's watch that. So I know that's fast. I'll talk through that one more time here. So once you have the list of students that meet the criteria that warrants intervention, you can select them and click on our platform, create a group intervention. And here's where you would name the title, the purpose, how you're going to track it, who's going to monitor it, at what frequency you're going to administer it. Um, and so this lives in the platform. And anyone who has access to those students will see not just their data, but they'll see, um, you know, what's, what kinds of services those students are receiving. I think we have time for, to, to flow through this third option here. Um, third question. So this brings together, this third question brings together behavior and social emotional learning. So how many students reporting below average self-reporting below average and self-management are also at risk in terms of their behavior. So this is often a, an inquiry that um, educators are wondering, you know, if, if, they, if students say they can't really self-manage, or, or is that the group of students that's struggling with, you know, maybe mild sustained misbehavior? Um, and let's look at, again, so answering this question on the platform, let's look at a, a pre-recorded uh, clip to see how you do that. So again, starting with the specific SEL topic, so self-management, those self-reporting lowest. And then let's look among those seven students in this case, who's also struggling with behavior. And so, you know, one thing, especially when we see, you know, uh, behavior challenges for a student, one of the things that we recommend, and I think, you know, Dr. Allen, you referenced this, is it's all about relationships. So we probe there first. Um, you know, and here's one of the common, you know, if, if you're, if a student, particularly younger grades, um, is having mild sustained misbehavior, or even more than that, um, this is an evidence-based strategy, two by ten relationship building that we often recommend. Uh, to try as proactively as possible. So, um, you know, have, and Nicole referenced this earlier, but it's just two minutes of time. Invest two minutes of a positive conversation with the student for 10 consecutive school days. And a strong recommendation to have the conversation not be about uh, academic schoolwork or behavior, because oftentimes if a student's a candidate for this, you know, that conversation is being had often anyway, so it's get out ahead of that, commit to a short but consistent um, touch point with the student about something other than that, um, and we and we've seen that this uh, this improves relationships um, as well as behavior. And so, if something like this, just want to demonstrate, um, if something like this were, were to be uh, delivered to an individual student. 
in student success, you can know that that intervention uh, is, is being delivered to the student. And so here again, is a, this is a brief recording of what it would look like to know something like that at the student level. Very similar to the, to the group intervention plan, but this would be um, for the students specifically. And so it wouldn't be you know, trackable in a group of several students. This would be when I click into this student's profile, um, I would see that you know, this intervention is taking place. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. Before we turn to Q&A, we have a few resources we wanted to share. You can download our research-backed and validated social-emotional learning survey on our website. We saw a couple questions on that in our Q&A. Um, we also have an interventions and progress monitoring uh, toolkit to help you support your MTSS program. And I wanted to make sure to link the research that we referenced earlier between correlations in SEL and the ABCs of attendance, behavior, and coursework that we discussed earlier. Um, finally, if you're interested in learning more about um, Doug's work on strategic advising, you can email him directly. Um, this is his Panorama email address, so feel free to do that as well if you're interested in learning more. With that, we are excited to take some Q&A. Um, our first question is for Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen, the question is, how can I increase buy-in for SEL in the classroom and for adult SEL as well? I think you've got perfect timing with how, how we ordered that because you just referenced that research website that people can go to and, and look through the research that ties social emotional learning with those ABCs. I am also a frequenter of CASEL's website because they've got so much research backing the reasoning why we integrate social emotional learning. I think anytime you've got something that's in written format, people are showing its effectiveness in numbers, that's really going to help your case. And then the other component, just like I emphasized earlier about the human component being so important, is demonstrating how much better things can be when you are practicing those relationship skills, uh, responsible decision making, just all of those different components, and really taking care of our adults first. Because when they see how wonderful it feels to be valued and to be able to function as well as possible, they're going to see the benefit to how their students can function more appropriately in the classroom. And along with those resources that were shared, I wanted to also mention for those of you who weren't looking at group chat, I saw a question come about about the local screening tool that we made in Johnson County. So there's a bit.ly in the chat box backslash capital SEL lowercase NTSS, but on that form, if you scroll down, there is a link to the locally developed SEL screening tool. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Allen. Um, the next question is also for you, and it is, do you need a social-emotional curriculum or program to make SEL work effectively? If so, do you have thoughts on which ones are the best? So, <clears throat> against what we might see in some places, I, and, and this is my opinion, I'm not done research on this one way or the other yet, but I don't feel like you need to have a specific curriculum to work through as long as you are really being intentional about how you're integrating and building on your self-awareness, your student self-awareness, and their self-management along with yours is actually probably the most important SEL component to focus on when we're talking about trajectory with student success. But, you know, box curriculums, it doesn't work for every educator. Sometimes you can muddle through something because you're trying to follow a script very closely, whereas if you're just teaching yourself how to integrate these practices into your day-to-day -day teaching style, it's going to come through more organically, more passionately. The point is that you're teaching these strategies and we're all assuming that we need to learn them and we need to improve upon them as human beings. That makes a lot of sense, Dr. Allen. Our next question is for Doug. Doug, in your work working with school districts across the country, what are some common challenges that you see? Love this question. Yeah, I would say um, three challenges come to mind, and so I'll name those and then try to state them, uh, the solutions positively. Uh, challenges, uh, number one, too many priorities, even within SEL, trying to 
to improve two, three, four topics in a year. Um, another challenge is um, having SEL messaged as another thing and have it register as another thing that's taking up competing with space and not integrated into academics and behavior. Um, and then the third is more generally building buy-in. And so, you know, the way we address those challenges in terms of priorities is, you know, identifying one or maximum two priorities for SEL improvement, and then having your theory of action be such that if we improve this thing, we believe it'll be a lever to other, to other constructs that we care about. Um, so number one would be to really focus on having ideally one, but maximum two priorities within SEL. Um, number two is for the, you know, another thing kind of phenomenon is tie SEL deeply into something that already has momentum and folks are already kind of convinced of and moving with. So for example, academics, growth mindset, you know, that's not a new thing this year because we're measuring SEL. That's deeply and actually written into most uh, mathematics standards. You've got to persevere, you've got to push through to solve challenging problems. So it's not like growth mindset is this new thing. This is how we do things such as mathematics uh, better. And then finally, uh, building buy-in uh, with staff. Uh, it kind of a, goes without saying, but the, the quicker you can get staff to have the microphone, so to speak, the, the quicker that you in your initiative can get uh, leaders at schools, counselors, teachers up talking to their peers about what they're doing and why it's working, um, the, the more traction you're going to get. And I know initially it's got to kind of be the district perspective, but the quicker you can get people on the ground on site talking and sharing, the, the better. Awesome. Doug, thank you so much for your reflections. I think we have time for one more question, and Dr. Allen, it's for you. The question is, how can we support school staff who are looking for Tier 2 and Tier 3 SEL supports when we know quality Tier 1 support is lacking, um, but we also see in our district that the student has SEL skill needs? That is an awesome question. I think there's two different school of thoughts that we have with this one. The first being that you really can't tell the level of additional support the kid needs if those core supports are not there. So even though those core supports might not have been there in the past, if you do some work to put some of them in place, it can really help alleviate some of those behaviors. The other school of thought, of course, is that you try to jump to those tier two, tier three interventions but you will see in those practices that if you're lacking some of those foundational things, especially if there's something that goes along with the relationship that the student has with the classroom teacher, your efforts at Tier 2 and Tier 3 are not going to be as successful as if you went back and kind of looked at the whole picture of what things would be good for this student in the classroom that would probably also be good for some others. Um, but speaking from my own personal experience in responding to classroom things that were going on, tier two and tier three support. I do think that your counselors are awesome people to consult on these matters. Tier two, I ideally would want to see some teachers supporting the integration of those practices because that is still at the level that you want things to stay in the classroom. But when you're moving to tier three, these might be your students who really need some time to breathe every once in a while when they're getting highly escalated. And to do that, you usually need some partnership with either another teacher, your counselor, somebody who can um, come in and just remove them from that setting for a little bit, along with some other intensive support. But that's when you're calling in some support from specialists versus tier two being with um, getting some stuff for the teacher to integrate to make that academic setting more ideal for that student in question. Awesome. Dr. Allen, thank you so much. I hope that was helpful to the audience. That's all the time that we have for today. I want to give a big thank you to our speakers, Doug Hassett and Dr. Amanda Allen. Dr. Allen, thank you for taking the time to share your district's approach to using SEL for student support with us here today. We are so grateful and appreciative. And thank you to our audience for your attention, engagement, and your questions. Um, a reminder that the recording of this webinar will be sent out and posted on our website, www.panoramaed.com. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful day.